and welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I will be your host as we delve into the world of art and the artists that live among us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For registration and event information, go to the website svos.org. Our guest is sculptor Rebecca Truman, and she believes that in order to create art, one must truly experience life. So, she has crossed the North Atlantic several times, once in a small scientific boat at, amidst 20 to 40 foot waves, five times she's crossed the Atlantic in a small airplane, two-seater. She has painted a mural in Italy in an orphanage, and she has been hidden from an island chief who had matrimony on his mind, and she has created an 11-foot bronze sculpture, a war memorial. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. It's great to be here, Sally. Yeah. I appreciate that. Well, thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. So tell us a little bit about the War Memorial. Let's take a look at a picture of it. Okay. And where is it and what is it about? The War Memorial is in Los Altos. And it was created by a, well, it was all started by a gentleman by the name of Bill Henderson. And he's a citizen of Los Altos. And he decided Los Altos needed one. And so he started the whole thing. So it was a commission piece. It was a commission piece. He. Um, did a nationwide uh, juried contest looking for the artist. And much to everyone's surprise, the person they picked happened to live in Los Altos. Los Altos, that's yeah. excellent. Isn't that so great? congratulations. Thank you. So obviously in your art career, you didn't start out creating enormous bronze sculptures. So no. tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you go to school? And how did you get started doing art? Well, if you go way back, around the age of, I don't know, four, six, um, my parents were visiting a dear woman who, in her backyard, which was several acres of trees, she had placed sculptures of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, or a deer, or a fawn. And as a young child, going along this path and discovering these things was really enchanting. And then later on, when I was about 12 years old, I went to a craft fair and met a woman who um, was doing frogs in bathtubs, that's all I can remember, but she saw how enchanted I was with her work. Oh. And she was just a sweetie, and she came by and gave me 25 pounds of clay. I made it all into all different kinds of sculptures. She took them, fired them, came back with a glaze set. Oh, nice. Yeah, bless wow. her. And fired them all again, and I haven't quit since. So it's, that's how you got started. That's how I got started, because oh, of her, her gift, and I'm grateful. Excellent. So then did you go on to any schooling in art? Or? Well, I ended up going to UC Santa Barbara because they had a foundry in bronze. And I thought that was a skill that I definitely needed. So I graduated from there. Oh, excellent. So mm -hmm. you had experience in college in a foundry. In a foundry. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I knew from the beginning I always wanted to do sculpture. So what were some of your first sculpture pieces? How did you really get started? Well. They've improved since I was 12, yes, um, I'm sure. but they <laughs> tended to be pretty goofy and fun, kind of like these uh, chess pieces right here. Um, and I was, <laughs> my dad tried to teach me chess, and it just wasn't working because he'd say, this is a knight. And I'd say, uh-uh, that's just a little piece of wood. Um, that pawn right there is my older brother, Mark. And if you look over here, this is my brother, Tim. I bet Tim didn't know that till now. <laughs> this is my brother Nathan. He didn't know that till now. And so I just made them into play, into joy. And that's what clay is for me. It's a form of expression. I love how they each have their own different expression and facial features. It's They're individual people. Yes. And so what are they made out of? These are made out of clay. Um, they've been hollowed out the, and then bottoms have felt on them and then I got to play with them and put on belts and he's the bishop and um, he has this little cross on. I, they were just fun. Uh, for me, art is a second language. Yes. And 
um, no, excuse me, art's my first language, English is my second language. There you go. I think in terms, <laughs> I, I express myself through art better than I do through words, apparently. Um, <laughs> but that's about how it started off. It started off with pretty goofy sculptures of people. Those are excellent. And so you brought some images of some of your test sets and some of the other clay sculptures that I you... I did. So let's take a look at those now and okay. see what, what you've been working on. Okay. Um, yeah, this is another chess set that I made, and this has, uh, it's very similar except I distressed the um, paint on the outside. So I'd paint them completely, and then I would uh, sandpaper it all off, and then I varnished it. So it just have a different, more rough-hewn look. I mean, after all, these were people out there playing war on the board of chess. <laughs> um, from there, the little tiny chess heads, I started making chest... Um, not chess heads, I started making portraits. And they started small, like in the chess pieces. But that's one of the first ones I made. And um, that's my cousin Rex. Surprise, Rex. Um, he was just a sweetie. And that moment of surprise I wanted to try and catch. I think so that is a clay sculpture. And what kind of coloring did you use on that? On that one, I used uh, acrylic paint. And I made that one in high school. Just a couple years ago. <laughs> um, the, uh, this one is it's dangerous to know me because when I see somebody who has an intriguing expression, I'm going to try and capture it in clay. And uh, that's what this guy is. I just saw him walking by and I thought, ooh, ooh, great face. That is an interesting expression. Albert Einstein. Uh, he just another great face. It's, it's, I just really love great faces. Um, that's Samuel Beckett. I saw his face. You can see in the background a little bit of his, uh, the, I think it was the cover of a magazine maybe, or an article. There's um, Van Gogh, and I tried to do the, his face in the texture of his painting. Oh, look at that. That's great. Thanks. It was fun. Ah, and there's Jean-Baptiste Molière. He was a playwright, and he was, I don't know personally, but my <laughs> guess is he hung out in bars, played cars, smoked, and was a cad. And when I saw him in the Gulbenkian Museum, I thought, yeah, I'd take him home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did. did. <laughs> but they wouldn't let me buy him or take him, as if I could afford it. And so I made him. And well, those are beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, and you brought some in the studio as well. I did. Well. So there's some um, in the front there. On the female down here in the, the whiter one, that is the niece of Princess Caroline. And then down here on the left in front of the chessboard is, uh, I had just seen a documentary on Eleanor Roosevelt. And what a woman. So. Uh, Eleanor, I decided I should do a sculpture of her. And so what you see right now is Princess Caroline's niece and Eleanor Roosevelt. The, the detail that you have and the expressions and the faces are really tremendous. How do you plan that when you're creating? Because obviously you didn't know Eleanor Roosevelt or have her pose in three <laughs> dimensions. So <laughs> how do you go about getting such great detail? Well, I'm really happy that someone invented images on the internet. And so what I would do is I would upload into my brain all the images I could find on Eleanor. And then I would, after studying them, I mean, I would spend, I don't know, eight, eight days, you know, a couple hours every day looking at these different images and trying to see what does she look like at this angle, how about that angle, what's her chin look like, what's her nose look like, and then all her different expressions. And given what that woman went through, I thought I would just give one of Triumph and Joy. Yes. Well, she's one of my heroes for yeah. sure. Definitely. She's a good one. Yeah. And so as you progressed from small clay sculptures with funny little expressions to mm -hmm. much more realistic expressions and very mature, you know, detail, very beautiful. So you then went on to create bronze sculptures, right? There was an interim where I created um, larger scale bodies in clay. But what I discovered was, is if you make a hand out of clay, the fingers dry out and they break off. Yes. <laughs> and 
you only do that so many times, so it become very discouraged. And I discovered something called plasticine, which is an oil-based clay rather than a water-based clay. Uh -huh. And you can make those fingers, and they stay there. I was quite thrilled. And so I started making lots of different sculptures in, um, in clay and in plasticine and working them out. And, and many of them didn't make it to bronze. Um, it was an exploration of the medium is what it mm -hmm. was. Um, the first one that I made out of clay, and I know out of plasticine, and went on to bronze would be Trust, which is right here behind us. Ah, so the ones you brought in the studio. Yes. So, okay, tell us about Trust here. Okay, Trust is the one on towards me, and Trust was created when I observed a dear friend who had a very good secure job with the retirement benefits and everything and decided to leave. And he decided to start his own company. And so he was leaping out into nothing. There was, there, there was no safety net anymore. So he was moving forward. So that's the one who's going forward. Yes. Okay. And when you, when you jump, when you leap, you lead with your, almost the diaphragm part of your body. You're just, you're just saying, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going. Right. You lead with your heart, except your heart's up here. You lead, you lead down here. Um, the one that's with it is called betrayal. And betrayal is when the same person found out that just because you work and you do exactly what your new client wanted you to do doesn't mean they necessarily feel like they're going to pay. Oh, no. Yeah. So he was betrayed. And so I thought trust and betrayal made a really good team and would probably look good in an attorney's office because <laughs> <laughs> what's going on yeah, there? Exactly. <laughs> trust and betrayal. Yeah. So then these were, um, I had these cast at a foundry. And then I did other sculptures quickly followed. For example, this one off to your right, the girl in the swing. Um, she was a summer that I missed. I was working so hard and doing all this stuff. I, sometimes I start on the sculpture and then I was trying to say, okay, what am I saying? What am I doing here? What, <laughs> what am I attempting to communicate? And that was the summer that I missed. Oh, it's a beautiful piece. And I love the way it's balanced. It's balanced on the foot, right? On the foot. whole thing is, yeah. a, is attached just with that foot. Yes. That is just absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Yeah. I love the perfection of detail that you get. That's amazing. I'm looking forward to how you get those details oh. into the bronze. It'll be fun. But you brought some other JPEG images. I did of some of, some of your smaller bronze pieces. So sure. let's take a look at those now. Okay. So they're really just... That's Trust from the back when I first made it. And he's leaping off. And in the section that he's leaping off of, there are, and you can't see it, sorry about that. Um, I took credit card images and pressed them into it like he's jumping off a cliff of, how would you put it? Oh, those darn words. Yeah, it's like a modern day hydroglyphics. That's what I was yeah. trying, that's what I was going for. And then trust and betrayal are interwoven. Um, but they're two separate sculptures. They're two separate right? sculptures, but, look at that. but they're interwoven. They're made to be together. Very nice. Thank you. Now, here is Dawn of Eve in clay. Um, you can see that there's a snake wrapped around her leg and going around her, and it's in her face. And I was trying to figure out what I was trying to say with her, and that's all about housework. You can't <laughs> go anywhere. You can't do anything. It's in your face. Right. Well, you can. <laughs> you can. Yeah, you, you have to eventually learn it. that. It's like, eh, <laughs> I'm out of here. Exactly. <laughs> well, let's, when you get started with these, how do you actually get, through the process from the clay or the plasticine to the bronze. And when you're, and then I'd also like to know how you make them bigger as okay. well. Well, um, let's say you have a piece of art and you make it out of clay. And for example, let's pretend this is clay right here. And what I would do is first using all those little tools and putting all those hours into it. You make the clay, then you put a mold around it, then you take off the mold, and sometimes that destroys the clay more often than not. But what you have is a negative of this. 
Then with the negative, so Here's all of the details that all were the in details. the clay are inside the mold. Yes. Oh, okay. And then what you do is you pour wax into the mold and you come up with this. Here it is in wax. And actually right here, if you can see it, that's what's called a gate. And that's how you pour the wax into the mold. And there are bigger ones. So there are holes in the, in the mold yeah. that you pour the wax into. You pour the wax into. And then you put a, um, I guess you can say like another mold around that, only this is made out of ceramic. So a ceramic around the wax. Right. Okay. And then you put that ceramic in an oven and you melt out the wax. Ah, so the wax melts out, yes. leaving a hollow. Leaving a oh, hollow. Okay. The lost wax process, as a matter of fact. Is lost what it's wax. And then when you have that, you pour the bronze back into the now, the, the ceramic thing. <laughs> It's the thing, yes. <laughs> the ceramic thing, and then you pour the bronze in, and you end up having this in bronze. Dun -dun -dun. And you do it piece by piece. Yeah, when there are parts that stick out, like for example this, the arms had to be cut off. So those are the two arms of the soldier holding the baby in your cradle of liberty. Yes. Ah, I see. And that's the smaller version. This is the smaller version. This is the first version. Um, you were asking earlier about how you go from small to big. Yes. Well, first you make it in clay. As a matter of fact, I think I might even have some pictures about this. Okay, let's take a look at the pictures of okay. the creating of the Cradle of Liberty. All right. Yeah. Um, oh, this is a wonderful picture of Bill Henderson. He's the guy that decided there needed to be a war memorial. And that's his wife and that's his wedding day. And that is the clay or the plasticine version of the, um, the Cradle of Liberty. Uh, when I was one of the three finalists, um, there were 400 artists that were in invited. And I was one of the three finalists. And so that's what I turned in after, after studying lots about war. I didn't know a lot about war. And all I knew was war was bad. And after... Um, reading books and sitting in libraries, the tears streaming down my face because I didn't know how low man could go and I didn't know how high man could soar and how that was a choice. And what I learned was is that these guys were heroes. Yes. Um, what we have here is the medium stage. So I went from the small stage and I hired a person whose profession is to enlarge clay and so I made the clay, he made the clay into a, with a mold and then into a, a resin so it would be stiff. And what we have, and then he enlarged it into this size. And I cleaned it up and, in clay version. And then he took that resin and enlarged it into 11 feet by 13 feet. And wow. the, yeah, <laughs> it was big. So what are some of the challenges that go into doing that kind of a process? Oh, the biggest challenge was um, when you have a little sculpture and you blow it up to 13 feet, if there's anything that's put in the proportions can correct, you find out. <laughs> and what I found out with this one is his head was not in the center of his body. And I only found that out after professionals crawled all over the statue and they couldn't figure it out. Um, pulled out a, a tape measure and discovered his head was not dead center. It was three inches off to one side. And there was a board going down the middle of his face, and I had to literally cut off both sides of his face, move one side over three inches, and then reattach the entire face, and then <laughs> remake it. That's not, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and I was doing it up on scaffolding. And wow. Because it was way up there. <laughs> so the next. Here they've taken the mold off and you can see it damaged the sculpture and it always does. But you can also see the expression and the expression is what I got from looking at the pain uh, of, what the guys, of what the guys went through. And I don't know, I have a tremendous respect for our servicemen now. Yes. Um, what we have here is is the big version of those little arms I just showed yeah. you. And that's in, I think that's in clay, and that's the big version. It's been blown up, and it's about to be reattached to the body so I can sculpt it as one piece. 
uh, here, remember all those molds I was telling you about? Yes. The molds, they're pouring the molten bronze into the casings. And you can see it takes several people to do this. And they're wearing asbestos outfits just in case <laughs> something spills. We don't like that. Um, once that gets cooled, then you literally take a sledgehammer and knock off the casing. And there's his face hanging upside down. Is that you with the sledgehammer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It's kind of weird. We do the same pose. Um, then it's all welded together. This guy right here loved to weld. And you can see the shiny spots on the child. And we're about to would remember the arms in, yes. in clay. There it is. There's the child again. He's in bronze. And so he's about to start uh, welding the arms back on. So this is definitely a group process. Yes. And you need a foundry to do it. Um, and that is the end result. And it took eight months. And now there's Jay Brandon. He was the good friend that Bill Henderson chose to help him raise the $100,000 and to convince the community that a war memorial was a good idea. Um, that picture's in there so you can get an idea of the size. It was a lot of work. Now one of the things that has happened that I didn't expect and didn't realize is that the sculpture has taken on a life of its own. This is a photograph of <laughs> of another photograph. These, this is a picture of women in Vietnam and that group of people, that convoy, that photograph was taken the morning of that convoy was ambushed that afternoon and many of the people were killed. And so at the base of the Cradle of Liberty, which is the name of the sculpture, um, they had put these flowers which said, we miss you. And heartbreaking, but that's when I realized that the Cradle of Liberty was no longer mine. It belonged to the community, and it's, it's continuing its mission and talking to people and letting them have a place to be quiet and to think and to know that these men and women who have served our country are truly wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it's an absolutely beautiful sculpture. And when you, in the process, I'm curious about that final clay process, did you go back and create more detail after the man had enlarged it? Did you go back and then work on p pieces and parts <laughs> that, besides the head moving? Yeah, um, when it comes back, because he's gone from 13 inches to 13 feet, basically, or 13 inches to 4 feet to 13 feet. The hand, instead of coming out looking like a nice little hand with fingernails and, and wrinkles, it comes out with, if, with fingers that are globs. <laughs> And so it's up to the artist to turn it back into a hand. And the whole body is like that. You get the basic structure. Right. Um, but the, the me, the artist, turns it back into the sculpture. So using the clay, did you use any different tools that you, while you were doing that <laughs> sculpting process from the small ones to the larger ones? You know, <laughs> I wish I'd had bigger tools. I, I had, you know, the little wooden ones. I once had this kid walk in and he goes, lady. <laughs> And he just pointed at me and he couldn't say anything because I was using such a tiny tool to do, you know, his eyes, his mouth, his ears. And I ended up with really big biceps, which was really fun. On you, not On the... me, not him. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, he had yeah. pretty big ones, too. <laughs> right, <laughs> just but... from dragging it over the clay because that was, that was 13 feet of clay. Wow. And so every, every detail, inch. all the yeah. you know, wrinkles in the uniform and his expression, all of that, you mm -hmm. basically had to redo. I had to redo. And I had to research the it. uniform. And um, find out what do they wear, what does it look like, what. So is this a soldier representing of any particular time period, or this is World War Two? World War Two. This is, it. yeah, it's, it's World War Two. So, and is there a story that you associate with the sculpture? I mean, as a soldier holding a small baby, it's not usually the picture we hold in our minds of. Oh yeah, um, of a soldier. What I'm trying to say with this particular sculpture is, is, well, the baby is wrapped in the revolutionary flag, the very first flag that men and women died under for our country. Right. And the baby's name is Liberty, hence the cradle of liberty. And I'm trying, what I'm trying, I'm trying to say many things, but one of them is we need our servicemen in order to retain our liberty. The serviceman has a Band-Aid on his arm to remind us of the cost of liberty. 
Um, and there's just a bunch more. Um, yeah, I'm interested. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful sculpture, so I appreciate Thanks. you creating it. So after this, you've created huge sculptures. Are you going to create more bronze sculptures, or do you have other plans in mind? Well, I never know what the universe is going to bring me. I still enjoy working in clay. I still enjoy making busts and chess sets. Um, people ask me to make chess sets that look like them and their friends, and it's like, sure, that'd be fun. Oh, excellent. Um, there's a, another bigger-than-life-size sculpture I'd like to make of a private sanctuary that has stained glass in the back and the three primary colors. And, and you would stand inside of it, and the colors would come down and bathe you in a rainbow, oh, which that I think would be really fun. very nice, yeah. And then I'm working on all sorts of different books and screenplays, and just the creative person needs to create. Create. So you're yeah. going into other fields of art? Is that what you just said? <laughs> writing, if writing's a field of writing. Writing, oh, okay. definitely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, however, that said, uh, photography, and uh, there's just so much to do, and there's so many different ways to speak, and I am cursed with, in, with curiosity, and so I'm always trying new things. Well, excellent. And thank you so much for being on Talk Art with us and sharing your wonderful sculptures and your beautiful sense of detail and story. Really appreciate your coming here. Oh, Sally. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you for watching Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain.